my name is Hannah Day. I just graduated from homeschooling most of my life, but this last year I've been at Pikes Peak Community College. This fall, I will finish my second year there and then I'll transfer to another college. I'm not sure on my, exactly my major, but I am interested in engineering. Hi, I'm Justin Deegan. I graduated from CSCS and I'm gonna go to UCCS this fall. I'm Catherine Flory. I'm graduating from the Classical Academy and I plan to attend Grand Canyon University where I'll be studying music education. Hi, I'm Noah Giles. I graduated from Falcon High School and I'm going to Pikes Peak Community College. I'm Haley Johnson. I'm graduating from Village High School and I'm going to Colorado Christian University in August as a strategic communications major. I graduated from Pine Creek High School this year and I'll be taking the gap year to hopefully eventually pursue a career in art therapy. Jack Lupton. I'm graduating from Falcon High School and in the fall I plan on attending PPCC.
up? I'm Ethan, it's Josiah Mitchell. Uh, we graduated from this house right here, actually. Um, and we're heading off to Louisville, Kentucky to attend Boyce College. We're doing a five-year master's program um, through the seminary and the college so that whenever we're done, you know, five years later, we'll have a master's degree. And then I know I'm personally going into the military. Me as well. Yeah, hopefully we can go special forces, do something pretty elite. You know, looking for some thrill. So that kind of thing. That's our plan right now. My name is Stephanie Mullenix. I'm graduating from the Village High School. I'm going to UCCS this fall and majoring in elementary education. My name is Jamil Namri. I'm graduating at Rampart High School and I'm going to go to UCCS in the fall and I'm going to major in the pre-med program. I'm Josh Parker. I'm graduating from TCA College Pathways and in the fall I plan on attending Pikes Peak Community College to finish my associate's degree. My name is Charlotte Phillips. I'm going to college this fall and I'm graduating from Estravo online and I want to be an elementary math teacher. I'm graduating from Mr. Rich High School, I should go out in July for basic training for the United States Army. I'm going to be a 68 Whiskey Combat Medic Specialist.
Lifetime TV. Welcome to my crib. My name is Jolaine Sockheld, and I am graduating from homeschool, and I am going to the makeup designery to study special effects makeup. I'm Emma Ward and I'm graduating from the Classical Academy. This fall I will be attending Samford University in Birmingham, Alabama where I will study nursing. Good morning. We are so glad you could join us online this morning or whenever else during the week you might be joining us. Today is a special day. We are honoring and recognizing our 20 high school graduates here at Vista Grande Baptist Church. We had a video tribute to our seniors that was playing before the service, and we will play that again following the service for those of you that might have missed that video tribute. Also this morning, you'll notice some other faces up here on stage along with Pastor Jay. Our student worship team will be helping to lead us in worship and song along with Pastor Jay. Well, what a year to graduate from high school. Uh, some of you older adults have those stories, or at least you tell those stories 
about how you walk to school barefoot, uphill, two miles, both ways, uh, however that works out. Well, I think this group of students might now have a crazier story. I think they have one upped all of us. Think about all that they've endured over these past couple months. They've had toilet paper shortages. They have gone through social distancing. They've gone through distance learning, line to get, lines to get into stores, face masks, online proms and graduations. What a crazy year. We are so incredibly proud of this group of students. Uh, but we're also proud of and thankful for our parents. We know that it has taken a lot of perseverance on your part as well to get to this point. For some of our parents, this is your first child to graduate, and we have other parents and families who this is maybe your last child to graduate, and you are about to be empty nesters. We are so proud and thankful for our high school graduates and their families as well. Each year I share this verse with our graduates and I think it's such a key verse. Uh, there's so many obviously great verses scattered throughout scripture, God's word to us. And I'm thankful for the verses, church family that you sent to us that we were able to highlight in their gift Bibles. But Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 says this. It says, trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him and he will make your paths straight. Graduates, encourage you this morning, keep your eyes on Jesus. Stay in his word and obey his word and stay committed to his church. Congratulations, class of 2020. Well, this morning as we prepare our hearts for worship, I would like to turn to Hebrews chapter 1, verses 1 through 3. It says, long ago at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son, whom he appointed the heir of all things, through whom also he created the world. He is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature, and he upholds the universe by the word of his power. After making purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. Would you join me in prayer this morning? Father, we come before you this morning. We're so thankful for the technology that we have to still be able to uh, worship together online this morning. Father, we admit that we continue to feel that tension of desiring to meet together in person and be together and be physically together. But Father, we thank you for this opportunity that we can uh, sing songs of praise and worship together, that we can listen to your word together. Father, this morning we are so incredibly thankful for and proud of our graduates uh, we pray, God, that all the days of their life, that they would uh, continue to keep their eyes, their gaze on you, their focus on you, Lord, that they would not lean on their own understanding, but, God, that they would trust in you with all their heart. Father, we pray that you would uphold them by your mighty, righteous right hand and that they would walk with you all the days of their lives. Lord, this morning, we also pray for our missionaries around the globe. Specifically this morning, we pray for Amanda Peck. We thank you for the pro-life ministry that you have given her in Macedonia and the opportunity, Lord, to um, talk about the sanctity of life and the importance of life, Lord. And we pray, God, as they are launching this new online ministry, God, that you would use it in an incredible way to minister to women there and around the world. Father, may they continue to be encouraged, and Lord, may you continue to use them to proclaim your good news and uh, the value of life. Uh, Lord, we, we pray this morning as we worship together in our homes that, that you would remove any distractions that would hinder us from worshiping you in spirit and truth. We pray, God, that you be honored, that you be glorified this morning. And, Father, we pray that you would give us an amazing day in the Lord. We pray these things in the powerful and holy name of Jesus. Amen. Please sing with us.
We are looking at a passage today that will reveal if the Bible is your authority or not, because the passage we're looking at goes against a lot of what we hear from the world. And the big question for us today is this, 
Will you willingly come under God's word? And will you say, you know, this is God's word and I need to change and, and, and come under it and submit to it? Or will you stand over God's word and say, I, I think I know better than this. And uh, my hope is that we will come under God's word. Today is also a day when we are recognizing our high school graduates. And I realize that it may seem strange to be talking about this topic, marriage for sojourners, on a day when we recognize our high school graduates. But I think it's related for a couple of reasons. Uh, one reason is because the, these guys and gals will be thinking about marriage in the upcoming years. And another reason is because this passage will serve as a test case for how you're going to respond to the Bible. Um, th this passage will reveal if you're going to come under God's word and let God's word govern you and rule over you, or if you're going to say, once again, I, I just think I'm smarter than God's word here. And so my hope is that we will all come under and place ourselves under the authority of God's word. We're going to begin this morning by reading 1 Peter chapter 3. I'm going to read verses 1 through 7, and this is the very inspired word of God. Likewise, wives, be subject to your own husbands, so that even if some do not obey the word, they may be won without a word by the conduct of their wives. When they see your respectful and pure conduct, do not let your adorning be external, the braiding of hair and the putting on of gold jewelry or the clothing you wear, but let your adorning be the hidden person of the heart with the imperishable beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which in God's sight is very precious. For this is how the holy women who hoped in God used to adorn themselves by submitting to their own husbands, as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord. And you are her children, if you do good and do not fear anything that is frightening. Likewise, husbands, live with your wives in an understanding way, showing honor to the woman as the weaker vessel, since they are heirs with you of the grace of life, so that your prayers may not be hindered. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we are grateful that you speak to us and you tell us how to think rightly about marriage. We confess that we are often way more influenced by the world and the message of the world on this issue. And so I just pray that you'd soften our hearts and you'd open our eyes and help us to love and to value and cherish and follow your wisdom on this. We pray it in Jesus' name, amen. Well, Peter addresses the wives first, and so that's what we're going to do. And we see several instructions here for wives. The first instruction is this, follow your husband's leadership. Look at verse 1, wives, be subject to your own husbands. The, the command is clear, be subject. We've already seen this command a couple of times already. For example, back in chapter 2, verse 13, he says, be subject for the Lord's sake to every human institution. We talked about this last week. He's talking about the governing authorities. Subject yourself to the governing authorities. They've been given to you by God as an authority over you. We also see in chapter 2, verse 18, where it says, Servants, be subject to your masters with all respect. Now, I can imagine someone at this point saying, wait a minute. He told slaves to be subject to their masters, and we no longer have slavery. That's a dated institution, and rightly so. So maybe in the same kind of way, marriage is sort of a dated institution. Maybe this command for wives to subject themselves to their husbands is dated, just like the slavery commands are dated, right? But here's the difference. Here, here's, the, here's the argument against that. Marriage was given to us by God. Slavery was not given to us by God. Slavery came after the fall as a result of the fall. Slavery happened because of a sinful world. Marriage did not happen because of a sinful world. Marriage was a part of God's good creation. And when you read the Bible from cover to cover, you see the same definition of marriage throughout, and you see the exact same instructions for marriage, the same parameters for marriage throughout. And so marriage is a part of God's good creation. It has not changed over time. Peter says in verse 1, one of the goals or one of the results of wives submitting to their husbands is that their husbands might be won over, won to the Lord. 
He's speaking here of, of those ladies who have husbands who are not Christians. And he says, perhaps you will win them to, to the Lord. Perhaps they will start obeying the word. And some of you could be in a similar situation. You're married to a man who is not a believer, or maybe he claims to be a believer, but he's not acting like it in any way. And you say, what do I do here? And that you have a very practical word from God. He says, he says don't emphasize your words. You know, he knows what you believe. So don't try to win him over with your words. Win him over with your life. Win him over by being a faithful wife. Pray for him and follow his leadership. And perhaps he will be won back to the Lord. He says in verse 2, he will be won over, verse 2, when they see your respectful and pure conduct. The word for respectful there is actually fearful. It's literally fearful in the Greek. They're your fearful conduct, your pure conduct conduct. And it raises the question, fearful of whom? Respectful of whom? And the answer is not fearful of your husband. The answer is fearful of God. You're not supposed to be fearful of anyone. Uh, we saw this last week where he said, you know, fear or honor everyone, honor the emperor, but fear God alone. We see that in chapter 2, verse 17. Just like the, the woman is supposed to have pure conduct before God, so she's supposed to fear God and God alone. And in doing that, perhaps her husband will see that and see her following his leadership, and he will be won back. God is your ultimate authority. We talked about this last week. There's no authority over you that's more ultimate than God. God is your ultimate authority, but he has placed people and institutions under him, but still over you, and your husband is one of those based on this text. So follow his leadership. And perhaps in following his leadership, you will win him back to Christ. Now let's talk real quickly about exceptions to this rule. Are there any exceptions? Is a wife supposed to follow her husband regardless? And the answer is there are exceptions, and the Bible's clear about this. For example, if he's trying to lead you into sin, you don't follow him. Right? This is why it's so important to marry someone that has the same convictions and values and faith as you. It's so important so that you're not in this kind of situation. Do you have to follow him if he's abusive? If he's abusing you, are you just supposed to continue to follow him? And the answer is no. You remove yourself from that situation. If it's a dangerous situation, you are at risk. Remove yourself, remove your children, involve the proper authorities, namely the police, and, and hopefully maybe he can get some help. All right? What if he's been unfaithful to you? If he's been unfaithful to you, are you still supposed to follow and submit? The Bible says he, he, you can justifiably leave that situation, that marriage, if he's been unfaithful. And uh, so there are some exceptions, and the Bible's pretty clear about these, but the, the text here is emphasizing following his leadership. Now, I like to point out to husbands, the text is not saying anything to us right now so far. The text will address us here in a little bit and tell us what our job is, but our job is not necessarily to make sure our wives follow our leadership. He's not saying anything to husbands here. He's just addressing wives right now. Wives, follow the leadership of your husbands. And I want to I address those of you who are uh, perhaps going to be looking to get married in the next year or two or three or four years. Um, I want to encourage ladies, look for a guy who's going to lead you well. Look for a guy that you can follow for the rest of your life. Don't just look for a guy that's cute, right? Don't just look for a guy that's thoughtful of you. He thinks so much about me. That's good. That's important. He needs to think about you. He needs to be thoughtful. But here's a key quality, a key characteristic you need to be looking for. Is he a leader who's going to lead me, lead me spiritually? And is he a person that I'm going to want to follow for the rest of my life? And is there evidence is there any evidence that he's going to lead you well? If there's no evidence right now, don't waste your time with him, right? And guys, you need to be looking for, for a lady who's going to follow you well and encourage you in that, encourage you in your leadership. You're not just looking for someone, do, do you have a good time together? That's important, but that's not the key quality. Do we have fun together, right? The key quality is not, is she attractive to me or not? That's important, but it's not central, What's central here, is she going to encourage you and follow you, and is she going to encourage you in that leadership? And this brings us to talk about the second instruction that Peter gives, and that is 
focus on inner beauty more than external beauty. Look at verse 3. He says, do not let your adorning be external. The braiding of hair and the putting on of gold jewelry or the clothing you wear. Now, some translations say it like this. Do not let your adorning be merely external. And I think that's accurate. I think that's right. I don't think he's saying you can't braid your hair and you can't wear gold jewelry and you can't wear clothing. Obviously, he's not saying that, right? So he's saying, don't let that be the sole focus of your adorning. And definitely included in this would be don't dress provocatively. Don't dress in a way that's trying to get attention from people, right? Listen to how Paul says this in 1 Timothy 2.9. Women should adorn themselves in respectable apparel with modesty and self-control. So I just want to encourage you, listen to your parents on this. If your parents are saying, you don't need to wear that out, honor them. Don't wear it out, right? And, and parents, it's your job to say, you don't need to wear that. You can't wear that. It's your job, right? And if you're on the fence and you say, I'm not really sure. I could see this going either way. Play it on the safe side, right? Honor God's word in this way. In verse 4, he says how the adorning should be, what the focus should be. Verse 4, but let your adorning be the hidden person of the heart with the imperishable beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which in God's sight is very precious. We tend to look at the outer appearance and make judgments based on the outer appearance. God tends to look at the internal. He looks at the character and he makes judgments based on that. Now, you and I have been in this unique time of quarantine and a lot of people have been unable to get their hair cut and they've been unable to go to the salon and now they're starting to kind of open some of that back up. And he's not saying here, you know, don't ever go get your hair cut. He's not saying here, don't ever worry about the, the external. He's not saying just let yourself go, right? You can go get your hair cut, right? You can go, you can take care of the outside. So he's not saying ignore the outside, but he's saying don't make that the priority, don't let your sole focus be on the external. Let the focus be on that which is imperishable, that which does not perish, the internal. That's what's precious to God. Right? Randy Travis said it like this. They say time takes its toll on the body, makes the young girl's brown hair turn gray. Well, honey, I don't care. I ain't in love with your hair. And if it all fell out, I'd love you anyway. We see this message in pop culture. The, the message is an emphasis on internal beauty over external beauty. You'll find it in a good country song. You'll find it in Disney movies like Beauty and the Beast. Focus on internal character over external beauty, right? So why is this so controversial? The Bible is just saying focus on internal beauty over external beauty. That's not controversial. Disney creates movies based on that premise. Here's what's controversial about the Bible. Listen to how God defines internal beauty. What does internal beauty look like? He tells us in verse 4, it's the beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit. You won't see that message in a Disney movie. Internal beauty is the beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit. How do you know if you've got that? How do you know if you're a person who has an internal beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit? I think largely you can know it by how do you receive this word? How do you hear this? Some of you hear it and you say, I like that and I want that. And I want to be that person who has a gentle and quiet beauty about me. Right? Some of you say, well, pff, that's just not me. I've taken my personality test and that's not me. That's not my personality. I'm loud. I want everybody to hear me and that's just who I am. Right? So the, here's the question. What are you going to do? God's word is saying to you, this is what beauty looks like. And you have a choice. You can say, I'm going to submit to God's word or I'm going to stand over God's word. And I'm going to be the one to determine what I think is beautiful and right and true here. I encourage you, come under God's word here. Right? And this brings us to a third instruction. The third instruction is fear God alone and hope in him. In verse 5, Peter appeals to holy women in the Old Testament. Specifically, he mentions Sarah. Sarah's husband was Abraham. And he references this example in Genesis 18, 12, where Sarah refers to Abraham, her husband, as her Lord. 
says she obeyed her husband. She obeyed her Lord, and she calls him Lord. And Peter here is using this as an example. He's saying, wives, follow the example of these holy women like Sarah. Now, I don't think Peter is saying, wives, you're supposed to call your husband Lord or Master, right? But I think what he's saying is this should be your same spirit, a spirit of submission, a spirit of, of following his leadership. And I want you to notice the emphasis is not on how honorable Abraham was. He's not saying here, Sarah followed Abraham because he was such a great leader, or Sarah followed Abraham because he was such a great husband. Abraham messed up significantly. There was one time when Abraham told people that Sarah was his sister instead of his wife. That's a major mistake. Don't make that mistake. The text is not saying she followed Abraham because he was so great. The text is saying she followed Abraham because she was hoping in God. Verse 5, this is how the holy women who hoped in God used to adorn themselves. Right? And in verse 6, he says, you are her children if you do good and do not fear anything that is frightening. We are her children. We are her descendants. We are children of God if we don't fear anything that's frightening. We fear God, but we don't fear anything or anything, anyone else, even if it's frightening. I could imagine it could be frightening to hear these words, follow your husband's leadership. That could be frightening. What if he doesn't appreciate it? What if I try to follow him in the way the Bible is talking about and he doesn't appreciate it? What if I try to follow him and he takes advantage of it? And he says, oh, I see now you're going to follow me. I'm going to just sit around and do nothing. That's a frightening idea, right? But what if it's not easy? What if following him is not easy because he's not a great leader? He's not a real honorable person. It's the, the prospect of following him might be frightening. He's not saying here it's easy. He's not saying, I'm calling you to follow him and I'm telling you it's easy. It's not what he's saying. It's not going to be easy. I, I've read an article this past week, a couple of articles that talk about some of the challenges that are created now that husbands are staying home more than they used to. And one of the challenges is division of labor. Who does what? And there's a lot of discrepancy in how much work husbands think they're doing and how much work wives think their husbands are doing. Listen to the headline. One of the headlines that I read, it said, nearly half of men say they do most of the homeschooling. 3% of women agree. Half of men say, I think I'm doing most of the homeschooling around here. 3% of women say, yeah, you're right. We agree with you, right? There's a failure to communicate here somewhere. Something's being lost in translation, and it makes sense. And the point that the text is making here is not follow him because he's such a great leader. Follow him because he understands the division of labor, and he's taking on so much labor around the house. That's not what it's saying. Follow him because you fear God. Follow him because you want to honor the Lord. And you, want, you know that there's a reward in this for you. Just like we saw last week, there's a reward. You follow him even when it's difficult, but you do it as unto the Lord. There is a reward that's waiting for you. Right? He will reward your faithfulness. Now let's transition and let's address the husbands. And in verse 7, Peter addresses the husbands. And the main point for husbands is this. Be understanding and honoring. Or I would say it like this. Lead in such a way that she wants to follow your leadership. Right? Listen to verse 7. Likewise, husbands, live with your wives in an understanding way, showing honor to the woman as the weaker vessel, since they are heirs with you of the grace of life so that your prayers may not be hindered. He says, live with your wives in an understanding way. The King James Version says, according to knowledge. That's the most literal translation. Live with her according to knowledge. Knowledge of what? First of all, knowledge of God. God gave her to you as a gift. You need her. She completes you in a way that you can't complete yourself. She makes up for your weaknesses. You need her. Live with a knowledge of your need for her and the fact that God has gifted you with her. Right? This is sort of a silly example, but a very real example at our house. I need Whitney to help me find things. I'll, I'll be looking in the pantry and I'll say, there's no ketchup. We're out of ketchup. And she'll come over and she'll say, there's ketchup right there and there's ketchup right there and there's another bottle right there. Oh, thank you. I didn't see that. Right? 
I don't have any socks. There's no socks. Yeah, you got socks right there. They're right there in the drawer. Oh, yeah, how did I miss that? Right? I've, I've actually gotten to the point now where I no longer say we've lost this. I just say, I can't find this. You know, I used to say, we've lost it. We don't have it. And I've learned my lesson. You don't say that. You say, I can't find this. Could you help me find this? Right? There's a lot of ways in which I need her. Right? And I, I need to live with a knowledge that I need her. She, she, she uh, completes me. She, she meets weaknesses that I have and, and, and makes some strengths because of her. Also living with the knowledge of her is living with the knowledge that I'm going to have to give an account to God of how I honor her and treat her. And God has given a pretty high standard. The Bible says I'm supposed to love her the way Christ loved the church. How did Christ love his church? He died for her. He bled for her. He got on his hands and knees for her. I always tell husbands in marriage counseling, you can always do more. You're still alive. You're still breathing. You can do more. You can sacrifice more. You can serve more. You can love her more. You can honor her more. Live with a knowledge that God is going to give. You're going to give an account to God for how you treated her and whether or not you treated her the way Christ treated his church. Living with a knowledge also means living with a knowledge of her. What does she need? What are her needs that I can meet? How can I honor her and serve her? Once again, a silly example, but a real example in our house, Whitney recently shared with me that she really likes it when I'm the last person to use the cured machine and the water is low and it's empty and it needs more water. If I will fill that back up and not leave it empty, she said, I really appreciate that. It really means a lot. It lets me know you're thinking about me. So ever since then, if it's on empty, I will fill it up. Even, even this morning, actually, I was kind of running late trying to get here and I, I, it was empty. And I had the decision to make, am I going to fill it up or not? And I filled it up. I'm very proud of myself, right? I filled up the reservoir because she expressed to me, this is important to me. Listening, what's important? How can I serve her? How can I honor her? How can I meet her needs? Right? This is what it means to live in a knowledgeable way. In verse 7, once again, he says, showing honor to the woman as the weaker vessel. Let's be honest, that's politically incorrect. Right? Weaker vessel, weaker in what way? I think it's pretty obvious, that weaker in a physical way. Yeah, for the most part, she, she's weaker physically. Right? Once again, it's politically incorrect, but we understand that. If you can't get the pickle jar open at home, who do you give the pickle jar to? You usually give it to Dad. Dad, can you open this for us? Right? We understand this. The world understands this. The world will not speak like this. The world will say, Men and women are totally equal and the same in every single way. They're the same in every single way. And we just say, we just know that's not true. It's just obvious. Common sense says that. Sports says that. The Olympics say that. Why do they have Olympics men's running and women's running? Men's track and field, women's track and field. Women's uh, swimming and men's swimming. The world understands this. There are differences. And we understand this. There are differences. And they're good. The differences are good. We should celebrate them. The differences are wonderful. They're God-given, and they're to be celebrated. And just because there's differences doesn't mean, therefore, that they're not equal. Men and women are equal even though they're different. And we see that in our text. He says, since they are heirs with you of the grace of life, you're equal. You're both heirs of God. You're both children of God. Sons and daughters are equally children of God, equally saved, equally worthy of, of dignity and respect and value. There's not one that's more valuable or less valuable, but there are differences. Differences doesn't mean not equal. It just means different. This is how the Bible speaks, which, by the way, this was very progressive in its day, very cutting edge in its day, very radical in its day, this idea of equality between men and women. It's, it's biblical. And he's saying, live with a knowledge of that. You two are equal in every way. But you are different. You're very different. And you have different roles that you're being called to. And he says, live with the knowledge of that so that your prayers may not be hindered. He's saying, this is very important. Honoring your wife is extremely important. You cannot be a jerk to your wife and assume that you're on good terms with God. Your relationship with your wife and the way you honor her and treat her is a really good indication of your spiritual relationship with the Lord. 
If she's not following you, there's a really good chance the reason she's not following you is because you're not leading well. And if you're not leading well, there's a really good indication the reason why you're not leading well is because you're not on good terms with God. He's not hearing your prayers, he says. Your fellowship with God is cut off. So what's the point? Honor her well, lead her well, serve her well so that she wants to follow your leadership. She can't help but follow your leadership because you're leading so well. You're leading like Christ. Right? Let's ask this question. Why does he give so much attention to addressing wives and less attention to addressing husbands? Why six verses for wives and one verse for husbands? Why last week did he solely address slaves and he didn't address masters at all? Why does he address citizens submitting to the government and he doesn't address the government? That would have been nice. Right? And the answer is, he's addressing us as sojourners. This is the theme. You are sojourners. You're not at home in this world. You're passing through, and this world is not your home. And what comes with that is pain. And what comes with that is suffering. And what comes with that is very difficult situations. And the one he mentions here is the wife who is a believer who's married to a husband who's not a believer. That's tough. That's difficult. And that woman is symbolic of God's people. This is the kind of situation we're in. We are sojourners passing through a broken world. Our home is heaven, and we experience suffering while we're here in the meantime. And he's saying, be faithful. And he's also pointing us to Christ, who was the ultimate sojourner. Jesus left his home. He left his father's throne above, and he came here. And he was a sojourner here. This world was not his home. He had nowhere to lay his head. And he experienced suffering here. We saw this last week at the end of chapter 2. Very important. When he was reviled, he didn't revile in return. What did he do? He submitted himself to the Father. He submitted himself to the Father's will. He was submitted. right? And, and he did it for us. By his wounds, we are healed. He did it for his bride. He did it because he loved us so much. And the question for you and me this morning is this. Do you know his love in this way? Have you experienced his love his incredible love. Some of you are in relationships right now and they're struggling. You're in marriages right now that are struggling. Some of you have had broken relationships in the past and you're still hurting over that. Some of you are longing to be loved. You want to be married. You want someone to love you for who you are. And I just want to encourage you, there's only one who can love you in the most satisfying and the deepest way that you're longing to be loved and it's the Lord Jesus. And I encourage you, if you've never gone to him, go to him and experience the love that you're deep down craving and you need and you're longing for. It can only be found in Christ. And you'll never be able to truly love or be loved if you don't first know his love. So go to God in Christ and be loved by him as a bride. The way you're longing to be loved. And my next question for you is this. Are you allowing... God's word and, and the gospel to be what's, what's driving you in the way you think about marriage and the way you think about your spouse. Husbands, love your wives the way Christ loved the church. Are you leading her like that? And wives, are you following his leadership the way Christ followed the leadership of the Father? Let Christ's love for you and God's word be what guides you in your marriage as sojourners. Let me pray for us. Father, I pray for those who are tuning in, listening. They're longing for love. They're longing to be loved. Father, I pray that they'll look to Christ and find the love they need in Him. Father, I pray for those who are struggling in their marriages right now. Marriages are on the rocks. I pray that they'll look to Christ, look to the gospel, and that will be what will compel them to keep going keep serving, keep loving, even when the love is not returned and reciprocated. Father, I pray for especially our graduates and for those who are in our church who are thinking about marriage in the upcoming year and years. Father, I pray your word will be what guides them as they think about what marriage is and as they think about what they're looking for in a spouse. And Father, I pray especially for our graduates as they're transitioning to the next phase of life that they will love your word and cling to your word and come under your word. Father, I pray they'll not be influenced by the messages of this world that are so much in conflict with your word. I pray their instinct will be to cling to and cherish and value your word 
It's where life is found. We pray this in the strong name of your son, Jesus. Amen. Well, if you have any questions about what you've heard here this morning, we would love to answer those. Uh, or if you have needs that we can meet, prayer requests, email us at info at vgbc.org, and we will follow up with you and try to meet those needs and answer those questions. Uh, our, our, our high school students are going to lead us in a couple of songs. We are very proud of our graduates. We're proud of you, and we do hope that everyone will, will stick around and watch the video that honors them after our worship service.
worship you. I worship you. You are here, working in this place. I worship you. I worship you. You are here. Thank you for joining us this morning. Just want to remind you, after the service, we are having a slideshow honoring our 2020 graduates. Again, thank you for joining us. Hope you have a great day. God bless.
name is Hannah Day. I just graduated from homeschooling most of my life, but this last year I've been at Pikes Peak Community College. This fall, I will finish my second year there and then I'll transfer to another college. I'm not sure on my, exactly my major, but I am interested in engineering. Hi, I'm Justin Deegan. I graduated from CSCS and I'm going to go to UCCS this fall. I'm Catherine Flooring. I'm graduating from the Classical Academy and I plan to attend Grand Canyon University where I'll be studying music education. Hi, I'm Noah Giles. I graduated from Falcon High School and I'm going to Pikes Peak Community College. Haley Johnson. I'm graduating from Village High School and I'm going to Colorado Christian University in August as a strategic communications major. I graduated from Pine Creek High School this year and I'll be taking the gap year to hopefully eventually pursue a career in art therapy. Jack Lupton. I'm graduating from Falcon High School and in the fall I plan on attending PPCC.
What's up? I'm Ethan. It's Josiah Mitchell. Uh, we graduated from this house right here, actually. Um, and we're heading off to Louisville, Kentucky to attend Boyce College. We're doing a five-year master's program um, through the seminary and the college so that whenever we're done, you know, five years later, we'll have a master's degree. And then I know I'm personally going into the military. Me as well. Yeah, hopefully we can go special forces, do something pretty elite. You know, looking for some thrill. So that kind of thing. That's our plan right now. My name is Stephanie Molinix. I'm graduating from the Village High School. I'm going to UCCS this fall and majoring in elementary education. I'm graduating at Rampart High School and I'm going to go to UCCS in the fall and I'm going to major in the pre-med program. I'm Josh Parker. I'm graduating from TCA College Pathways and in the fall I plan on attending Pikes Peak Community College to finish my associate's degree. My name's Charlotte Phillips. I'm going to college this fall and I'm graduating from Estravo online and I want to be an elementary math teacher. I'm 
TV. Welcome to my crib. My name is Jolene Sockheld, and I am graduating from homeschool, and I am going to the makeup designery to study special effects makeup. I'm Emma Ward and I'm graduating from the Classical Academy. This fall I will be attending Samford University in Birmingham, Alabama where I will study nursing. 